Well, hello and welcome to another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. And this time round, we have a slightly unorthodox introduction. Um, I've been to a customer's house to collect this car and I'm bringing it uh, back to the workshop for work. Um, and uh, I've already identified a rather um, disconcerting noise coming from the engine, which is uh, a sort of rumbling, bearingy noise. I don't think it's anything serious. It sounds like an external bearing rather than an internal one to me, which is always very helpful. But um, we haven't identified, might be part of the supercharger setup, could be a belt bearing. Um, these are just my initial on the hoof diagnoses. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, other than that, it seems to be driving well. Um, I'm not using the superchargers at all because I don't know what the noise is. Um, the oil pressure is excellent. The car feels uh, okay, but I'm just driving it very minimalistically. Nowadays, cars like this, this is an Aston Martin Vantage V600 Le Mans. It's one of 40 built. It's 550 brake horsepower and it's very special. Um, and it's also in concours condition. Normally, um, we would have a car li like this, or the owner would have a car like this trailered to and from the workshop. But strangely enough, that doesn't really achieve anything because he also likes his cars to work. So this gives me a chance to diagnose faults, find out what's wrong with the car, because at some stage, somebody has to drive these cars. Otherwise, they just atrophy and look lovely, but fall away. We'll take it back to the garage. We'll have a little look. I'll do a little bit of a potted history of this most interesting car. The last um, of the Tadek Marek V8 engined Aston Martins. And we'll have a see if we can do an initial diagnosis to find the noise. Well, we've arrived back at the workshop um, after a rather interesting drive here. Uh, it wasn't quite the drive I anticipated because there's a rather unsavoury noise coming from the engine, um, which I can't imagine is anything uh, untoward because the car's done less than 10,000 miles from new. But um, we'll be looking into that and doing some investigating and uh, using our trusty screwdriver uh, putting the tip of the screwdriver on the engine, various parts of the engine, having a listen method to see if we can find out what it is. Um, but nevertheless, this is an interesting car to say the least. Um, it's the Aston Martin V600 Le Mans. It's the Aston Martin Vantage V600 Le Mans to give it its full, uh, rather bit of a mouthful title. And they made, um, they, they made them in 1999 between um, October, December 1999 and uh, October 2000, so for 10 months only. And they made the grand total of 40, which is what they intended to make. It's a very interesting piece of Aston Martin history, this car, for lots of different reasons. But uh, it was the last one to use the the famous Aston Martin V8 engine, the 5340cc 4cam V8, which had been around since, uh, actually in real terms, since the late 1960s, but in production terms, I think it was 1969-70, it actually went into the, uh, the DBS V8, which we covered uh, a few videos ago. So anybody who wants to look at that, feel free to do so. Like a lot of great engines, the, the V8 had a rather inglorious start to its life. Um, they put them, to, for proof of concept and for experimental testing reasons, they put them in some Le Mans races, if my history and my memory, which I'm digging deep into, I wasn't there, I'm pleased to say. I think they used them on Le Mans racing cars, Aston Martin, the, uh, the V8. Uh, it was designed by Tadek Marek, the, uh, the uh, Polish engine designer who worked for Aston Martin, who produced the, the beautiful straight six engine that came out in the DB4 and served Aston Martin fantastically well. In fact, paradoxically, that rescued them for a situation later on in life. But I'm getting slightly ahead of myself. Um, so they tried the V8 and it failed miserably. It ran its bearings. Uh, it did all sorts of things. Um, a very inglorious start to the V8's career. 
bit like the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine that um, was one of the probably one of the most influential pieces of machinery in winning World War II for the Allies. Um, the American airframe, the P-51 Mustang, was a superb aircraft. Uh, I'm going slightly off piste here, powered by an Allison V-12. And then when uh, they thought to themselves, hang on a minute, beautiful, fantastic American airframe, beautiful, fantastic Rolls-Royce engine. Let's try and put the two together. And they came up with the Mustang as it was. Fantastic piece of engineering. But the Merlin engine had a very inglorious start to its life too. The Rolls-Royce had all sorts of problems with that engine on the test bed. It threw rods out the side of the block. Um, they couldn't get the head gaskets to work properly. Uh, they couldn't lubricate various parts of the engine and they, they saturated other parts with oil. It was all going on. Um, but it's funny how some of the most glorious internal combustion engines in the world have had the most ignoble start and this was one of them so it eventually made it to production uh, as the dbs v8 uh, around the the cusp of the 60s and 70s and it served aston martin incredibly well for years to come after that and right the way through the v8 production it remained essentially unchanged for nearly 20 years, the Aston Martin V8. And then they brought out the, uh, the Virage in round about 1990. And they, Aston Martin pulled a bit of a blinder because it was a two valve V8 engine. It was one inlet valve and one exhaust valve per cylinder, great big valves. Um, and that, that had all sorts of disadvantages. So they, they got Callaway um, in the US, the Corvette, tuning possibly the thing they're most famous for is uh, doing wonderful work on Corvettes which has been officially recognized by GM for decades um, but the Aston Martin asked them to develop new cylinder heads for their V8 engine which Callaway did beautifully and they put four valve per cylinder heads on with smaller lighter valves which also allowed more air in and out of the combustion chamber etc 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 and that formed the basis of this engine so it gave the Tadek Marek V8 a shot in the arm life-wise uh, when they put that engine in the Virage. Uh, the Virage was a sort of low point in Aston Martin's history they used lots of items from other cars um, but what came out of that was a, a very interesting car um, called the V8 Coupe uh, which Aston Martin had called their cars that from the 70s right through the 80s, actually. But this was a whole different car. It was a development of the Virage. I think they made 100 of them, if I'm not mistaken. It was a very low number. It wasn't a great big brutal body kitted beast like this. Um, it was a fairly normal Aston Martin. But I used to look after one for some s several years, uh, a V8 Coupe, and it was a very sweet car. I can't remember what the power output was, 3, 380, 350 brake horsepower uh, with the Callaway heads on and fuel injection. But um, it was a very sweet car to drive that. And this is the development of that car. It's the V8 Vantage, as I say, it's got twin Eaton superchargers on it, still 5340cc, still the, exactly the same capacity as the engine was in 1970. This was the last car to have that famous, beautiful Tadek Marek V8 engine. It's a real turning point in Aston Martin's history. It's uh, the last of that series. The, the Vanquish that replaced it had that uh, V12 engine in it, which uh, originally started life because Ford owned Aston Martin when the Vanquish was um, announced. It was actually that V12 was based on two Duratorque V6s from the Mondeo, for example. Um, but what they ended up with was a beautiful sounding V12, as we all know from watching Daniel Craig punt them through tunnels in Italy and all sorts of places. Uh, all that series, DB9, Vanquish, etc., V12 Vantage, all have that beautiful sound. But that's the next generation. So let's go back to this one. Um, so this car came out, as I say, in December 1999. Um, it was launched at the Geneva Motor Show. They only ever intended to make 40 of them. Standard, with the twin superchargers, it developed 550 brake horsepower. Um, but I, the interesting thing is, almost all the cars had a, 
factory upgrade package, which was better brakes, better cooling, um, as well as more power. And that took it up to 600 brake horsepower and conveniently 600 pounds foot of torque as well. Out of the 40, um, it seems that this is the only car that is still the standard, I say standard, 550 brake horsepower. And these, I mean, this car weighs two tons. It was a very fast car, the 600 brake horsepower version. I know we're slumming it here with the 550 brake horsepower version, but the 600 BHP car would do 0 to 60 in sort of 3.8 seconds, which was stellar for a, um, an internal combustion engine car in the 1990s. There's a lot going on under here. Um, Heat-wise, friction-wise, etc. <clears throat> As I say, we've got to diagnose this noise. It's a very interesting car. They're, they're, they're quite valuable. They're changing hands for up to £500,000 now at auction. Um, and this, uh, this car was actually sold to the owner by Aston Martin Works Service. Can't get better than that. It's a beautifully original car. It is a Concorde winner. He has actually, he's very fastidious about his cars and he has actually entered and won Concours with this car at Aston Martin Owner Club events and things like that. So it really is something special. They went to a great deal of trouble with this car. It was fearsomely expensive um, in 1999. We're talking round about 220, 230,000 uh, pounds then bearing in mind that's uh, 25 years ago. <laughs> um, and Aston Martin, yeah, they, they, they sort of went to town a bit on this. It's got these lovely heated headlamp glasses. Um, the magnesium wheels were specially made for this car. They're hollow magnesium wheels to save unsprung weight. Uh, beautiful touch. The interior was custom done. They did various things. Um, and the reason why they called it the Le Mans was because it was the 40th anniversary of Roy Salvadori and Carol Shelby, hello, another American um, tie-up, uh, winning Le Mans in a DBR 1 stroke 2 for Aston Martin in 1959. So it was um, Carol Shelby, I think, has driven probably 90% of the cars in the world ever built, seemingly, or tuned them. Um, he seems to have got everywhere. We'll see if we can find that noise and um, we'll have a look around the car. Well, in certain respects, uh, unfortunately, the words British and craftsmanship don't necessarily hold true as much as they used to, which is a pity. But some aspects of this car are uh, lovely and some are curious and interesting. Um, Aston Martin have always used bits from other cars because they can't make handles, switches, levers, uh, things themselves. But before we move on to that, there is a lovely bit of um, all, all Aston Martins from the DBS V8 onwards, the late 60s, early 70s onwards, have always had doors that if they're set up properly, close beautifully. And I know it's becoming almost a thing on this channel that whenever I uh, change gear or something, the trusty um, little finger seems to do the work. But I'm going to just demonstrate how beautifully the doors work on this car. This is hand, hand formed aluminium. The, do the bodywork is made out of, which is craftsmanship in itself. But we'll just do this and this. How about that? And the seals enfold their charges all round the, the, uh, the door aperture beautifully. And um, you've got a, a lot to, uh, a lot going on there, but nevertheless, how about that? Lovely. Well, example A of our interesting Aston Martin historical curios is this, the interior door release handle. Um, I'm sure people uh, who are far more knowledgeable on this particular make and model of car than I am will tell me countless examples of different uh, things that we used. But um, this, this door handle assembly was originally used on a 1969 Jaguar XJ6 and Aston Martin used it on their Oscar India V8s all the way through the late 70s, um, right the way through. And here it is turning up on this again. A 1969 Jaguar door handle. Works though. 
Well, well, the theme continues with the, uh, the indicator side repeater lamp. Um, we looked at this closely and it's actually got uh, the Ford script upside down here, um, which we thought at first was a mistake. Um, till we looked at the other side and guess what? It's got an indicator side repeater lamp with the Ford script upside down so you can't read it as easily. Oh. <laughs> Hand-built cars. Well, here we have some other interesting examples of Aston Martin parts uh, bin raiding. Um, we have uh, these uh, face level or, or chest level vents, which come from a BMW 3507 series from the, uh, the late 80s, uh, early 90s. And um, the switch gear is from a Ford Escort. Uh, and the heater control panel, the climate control panel, is, I think, either Ford or Jaguar, one or the other. Um, but you know, Aston Martin couldn't make their own parts. This is a this is simply an economic situation. Uh, you know, you, you regard these things as either um, uh, utterly heretical, or you regard them as part of a hand-built car. Depends on which end of the telescope you're looking. For my money, it's still a pretty fabulous car. Well, we have to do some investigating here. The good news is that first impressions uh, tend to reveal that it is not something inside the engine. It is, after all, external. Uh, my money is on a uh, bearing on one of the supercharger drive belts, but uh, we can't do that in the scope of this video. But we will actually see uh, if we can um, delve into this more deeply. So there will be a part two to this video. Um, so in the meantime, Thanks for watching, hope you've enjoyed it. Please like and subscribe, it does help, and we'll be back with something else very soon.